Earth and all stars, flourishing planets, sing to the Lord a new song. O victory, loud shouting army, sing to the Lord a new song. He has done marvelous things, I too will praise him with a new song. Trumpet and pipes, loud clashing cymbals, sing to Blessed are you, holy and living one. You come to your people and set them free. Welcome to our worship. Whether you're joining us from New London or Newport or much further afield, we're glad that you are here. Technology brings us together to worship, to encounter the living God. Please participate as fully as you can. Jack Barbin has woven everything together so that all you need appears on the screen. Next Sunday, weather permitting, we shall gather in person outdoors at 8 o'clock to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. The 8 o'clock service will be broadcast live on this same YouTube channel so you can worship with us at home. Live at 8, or if you can want to sleep in any time after that. This morning, as usual, we begin with penitence. Today's epistle is a soaring passage from Romans 8. We are justified by grace through faith. God knows us better than we know ourselves. Our faults and failings are met with God's forgiveness. In the light of that forgiving and accepted love, let us confess our sins, initially in silence. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and healing forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by the Holy Spirit, and raise you to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
A reading from Genesis chapter 25. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is the birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Thank you. 
A reading from St. Paul to the Church in Rome, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the, to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the, of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit, which dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things and parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. 
who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Two words. Two words that St. Paul pens to some folks in Rome. People who are a lot like us. Folks who are struggling to make sense of their lives. Struggling to keep up with a fast-changing culture. Struggling to find their way in the strange flux of their times. And trying, really trying, to figure out what their faith had to do with all of this. In the midst of all this, they get this letter from St. Paul that sums up his take on how Christian faith deals with our human predicament. Before today's passage, in Romans 7, Paul has analyzed the human condition. We live, he says, according to the flesh, by which he means our fallenness, our focus on self rather than God, our attachment to things in the world. Paul sees in himself what we see in ourselves, our consummate failure to do the right thing. Paul admits, when I want to do right, only wrong is within my reach. What I do is not what I want to do, but what I detest. With Paul, we are stuck between knowing what to do and yet not being able to do it. Wretched creature that I am, Paul captures our frustration. I am a slave to sin. That phrase in our confession of sin, by what we have done and by what we have left undone, just about covers it. If there is a boatload of guilt for the things we have done, there is surely an ocean full of guilt for the things we have failed to do. And it's here, after Paul has acknowledged that we are sunk in sin, that's when the two words come. No condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you hear that? No condemnation. None. Nada. When not in some distant future when we've been made to pay for our failures. No. Now. Right now. This very moment. Why? Because God loves us enough to forgive us, to restore us, to welcome us back into her loving embrace. As the gospel passage suggests, God casts his seeds of love anywhere and everywhere with no regard for the conditions of the soil. My heart may be stony, it may be thorny, but it is still showered with God's seed. God's love is recklessly generous. No condemnation. This is the truth that Jesus embodies supremely on the cross. In his death, Jesus displays that his love is more powerful than anything, than our sin, than our confusion, our guilt, our sense of unworthiness. As David Lowe suggests, that last one may be the toughest, our unworthiness. Because no matter how many times we've heard that we're forgiven, and no matter how brave a show we put up, Thoreau was probably right that many of us lead lives of quiet desperation. Maybe it's some missed opportunity or long-held disappointment. Maybe it's a regret over a past wrong we did to another, or a difficult time getting over a wrong done to us. Maybe it's a pervasive sadness about our relationships with our friends or family. 27 years as a pastor has taught me that if you listen to almost anyone long enough, sooner or later you get back to this pervasive sense of not being worthy. A persistent conviction that when it all shakes out, they're going to come up short. Which is why we need to hear Paul's amazing pronouncement, no condemnation. To hear, that is, that no matter what we've done or has been done to us, no matter what we may have previously heard or presently believe, God loves us. God forgives us. God accepts us just as we are and sets us free to live lives of meaning, purpose, grace, and gratitude. No condemnation. The prodigal child is always welcomed home, no questions asked. 
I once spent 10 days in the desert between Beersheba in Israel and Mount Sinai in Egypt. In the early centuries of Christianity, thousands of Christians gave up everything and embraced a life of silence, celibacy, and intense austerity in the deserts of Palestine and Egypt. I had two books in my backpack, the Bible and a little book on desert spirituality. Among its nuggets of wisdom is this saying of John the Dwarf. We have put aside the easy burden, which is self-accusation, and weighed ourselves with the heavy one, self-justification. This is Paul's point. God's grace makes self-justification entirely redundant. And yet even the great mystics can feel compelled to justify themselves rather than relax into the embrace of a forgiving God. I would rather make excuses than face the truth of my failure. We have put aside the easy burden, which is self-accusation, and weighed ourselves with the heavy one, self-justification. John the Dwarf alludes to both the easy yoke Jesus offers to his followers and the heavy weight of the cross that he endures himself. And yet we prefer to justify ourselves instead of receiving God's free gift. The desert monastics helped me appreciate how counterproductive it is to cling to self-justification and my carefully curated picture of myself. This is the heavy burden. Committed to self-preservation rather than truth, I exhaust myself in the relentless quest to make myself look good. Self-justification is the heavy burden because there is no end to carrying it. There will always be some new situation where we need to establish our position, dig the trench for the ego to defend. The real hell is never being able to rest from the labor of self-defense. No condemnation. Those words release us from all that. Those words offer permanent respite from the onerous burden of making ourselves look good. This release is what God offers us. God's mercy and God's truth have met, become real and concrete in Jesus. And his death is dealt once and for all with the terrifying consequences of our failure so that we need not anxiously seek to make ourselves look good. Are you with me here? You need to be, because this is crucial. Scripture manifests the God whose very nature is to forgive. So we have no incentive to deceive ourselves, acknowledging the evil that we do and beginning to deal with that recognition constructively. We can, we can develop an identity that is truthful. God's gift of forgiveness means that I can dispense with the masks and begin to deal with the truth within. This is the liberating freedom about which St. Paul enthuses. No condemnation. God does all the heavy lifting. God's grace and mercy are made real for us in Christ Jesus. A grace that knows no boundaries, a mercy that has no restrictions, a love that always includes, never excludes. Try that on for size this week. No condemnation. No condemnation of me. No condemnation of you. Hear those two words this week and live into that truth. Paul says it will set you free. Free of condemnation, you can face up to the truth about yourself. We are released from what binds us, limits us, ties us down. Let those two words, no condemnation, penetrate your heart and mind, and maybe you'll find yourself less bound by your idolatries, your worship of security, popularity, beauty, money, work, health, whatever it is for you. Paul is right. Those two words set us free. Now, how about offering that forbearance, that grace to others this week? No condemnation of self and no condemnation of others. What would that be like for the next seven days? 
No condemnation of liberals or conservatives. No condemnation of protesters or of the president. No condemnation of rioters or racists. No condemnation of statue topplers or Confederate flags. No combination, period. I'm not asking you to withdraw from political and social engagement for a week. Activism does not require condemnation. There's an epidemic of condemnation in our nation. If you can just pause instead of rushing to condemn, you might just begin the hard work of understanding. What might lie behind that behavior? What might be going on beneath the surface? Try it this week. In most of the Bible, judgment applied not to individuals, but to the nation. So apply those two words to our country. No condemnation, because this nation is as prone to self-deception as I am. Original sin is real. The United States violated its ideals at its conception. All men are created equal. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our country was founded on the near genocide of one race and the enslavement of another. It's hard to hear, isn't it? So hear this too. No condemnation. Those two words can help us confront our history of evil and face up to the reality of present injustice. Instead of sliding further into denial, we can confront the truth and be roused to solidarity. Thus can the truth set us free, you and me as individuals and us as a nation. No condemnation. Those two words are not just St. Paul's, of course. Jesus had two words for us as well, judge not. And so be countercultural this week. Apply those words to yourself. Apply them to others. Apply them to our nation. Judge not. No condemnation. Amen. is present on earth in word and silence and cheering in face of doubt in depth of faith in signs of love and caring gentler than air wilder than wind sadly yet also deranging the spirit thrives in human lives both changeless and
Let us pray to God, the Lord of the harvest. Lord of creation, bless your church. We pray for all those communities who are gathering online for the churches that have reopened and for those worshiping in their homes today. Bless St. Andrew Church, Epiphany Church, and St. James Chapel and Son of Peace. However, and wherever we gather, help but sow seeds of love and kindness and other may receive a rich harvest of joy and peace. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of creation, bless the world that its leaders may sow seeds of justice and peace. Help us to share and conserve the world's resources and to live in reverence for your creation and in harmony with one another. Lord of the harvest, hear our prayer. Lord of creation, bless New London and Newport and this Sunapee Kearsage area, that we may bring forth the gentle harvest of the Spirit and live in harmony with one another. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of creation, bless those who bear the weight of affliction. That they may come to share the life of wholeness and plenty. Comfort those who are ill, whom we name before you now. In silence or aloud. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of creation, Bless those who have died. We pray especially for those who have died of the coronavirus. Gather them safely in and bring us all to our final harvest home. Lord of the harvest, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of grace, as you are ever at work in your creation, so fulfill your wise and loving purpose in us and in all for whom we pray. That your glory may be revealed and that the whole earth give praise to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. Let us pray. God of the heavens, God of the earth, all creation awaits your gift of new life. Prepare our hearts to receive the word of your son, that his gospel may grow within us and yield a harvest that is a hundredfold. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.
May God, who is the source of all goodness and growth, yield in your life a rich harvest of the Spirit in love and joy and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you.